the Kabbalah teaches us that that is the one soul that God created. He only created one soul. That is the soul of Adam. Okay? That one soul that he created described in this sentence is the one soul. That is the one soul that God created. Now, when we look around, we see billions and billions of people. Not only billions of people on the planet now, but billions of people who were on the planet and hopefully billions of people who will be on the planet. So how do we reconcile this one sentence in the Torah, okay, to, to, that, to, the, to the reality? And the reality is we are still that one soul. And the fact is, is that that one soul split into tiny little droplets of souls which make up the human race, past, present, and future. All right? Any ideas? Anybody want to answer? Any ideas um, when, when that one soul split up? Want to write something on the chat? Any ideas? When did that one soul split into all the billiard human? Great. Okay, one says Big Bang. It's a little bit too early, okay, because humans weren't there yet. Okay, Babel. That's a very good suggestion, but we've already got lots of people around at the Tower of Babel, but you're getting in the right direction. Well done, Joshua. I would suggest the Garden of Eden. The story of the Garden of Eden. Ah, Ephrat had a very good suggestion. Yes, Joshua, well done, the apple. Yes, it was. Okay, right, well done. Very nice. Now, Lauren and Kelsey are asking an interesting question about what about the creation of women, all right? Now, the Zohar teaches us that, in fact, um, the... When God created the one soul, they were created, at, he was created as male and female together. The one soul is both. Now, I've got here in, my, in the book, The Tapestry for the Soul, and I didn't actually print this out as a source, but I'm going to just read it to you. Um, where is it? Here we are. This is, this is from Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. On the day that God created Adam, he created him in the image of God. Male and female, he created him, and he blessed him, and he called their name Adam on the day of their creation. And the Zohar commenting on this says, Adam, that is the name Adam, is both male and female, and is not called Adam, except for the inclusion of both. And when Rabbi Ashley commenting says, he created them male and female, and he called the name Adam. Each one alone is only half a body, and is not called Adam. All right? So, if we go back to our source, okay? Oh, say close to the mic, sorry. If we go, if we go close to the source, I'll sort of hold it like this. If we go close to the source, then what do we see? Go back to the source. We say, Hashem Elohim et ha'adam. God created Adam. So he created male and female together. All right? So when we say God created the one soul, that includes all male and female. But Joshua said something brilliant. He said, the apple, well done. All right? When did it split? It's the soul split when, the, according to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, you can take that story as a, a literal story, or you can take it as an allegorical story. I don't mind which way you take it. But the truth of the matter is, is that the meaning is, is that God created 
Adam, Adam and Eve together, all right, as one. And he said, you can eat from all the fruit of the garden. But if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will surely die. Now, Robert Ashley teaches that the word die does not necessarily mean physical death. It means separation. You will get separated from me. All right. So the separation. OK, the, the separation that came about when they ate from the tree of knowledge. Now, the essence of the tree of knowledge was the essence of the will to receive. And that is part of our substance. What does the idea of eating mean? The idea of eating means that we take something into ourselves and it becomes part of who we are. Okay? So when you ate from the tree of knowledge, we ate from that apple, that will to receive, and it became part of who we are. So I'm going to look now at um, source number two. I think I opened the wrong thing here. I just want to find it one second. I'll, oh, I see. There. You did, I can share it if you want. It's okay, I found it. Oh, oh yeah, could you share it for me? That'd be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Brilliant, thank you so much. Okay, so here we are. Consequent to Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge. Um, okay, yeah, Joshua asked a question. I'll relate to your question in a second. Consequent to Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, the one eternal soul that was theirs in the Garden of Eden left them. And instead, this soul split up becoming all the souls that make up the human community, past, present, and future, such that each of us forms a part of the one original eternal soul that God created and gave to Adam and Eve. That's an extraordinary statement. Okay, let's carry on. This is from the introduction to the Panim Iroto Must Be Rot that Rabbi Ashlag wrote. Robert Asher was a great Kabbalist. Until, uh, unlike Adam's former life that was intended to be in the form of one soul, human life became in comparison like little sweat drops of life. That comes from the phrase that from the, the, from the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. That is to say, Adam's former life split into myriad droplets, such that every single drop is one part of his formal life. Now, this is the crucial bit. The sparks of souls that are shared out among the generations of the entire human community, all the generations of the human community form an array of one great chain. We're all part of that one soul. And in this way, the work of God, may the one be blessed, is not changed at all by the sin of the tree of knowledge, but that light of life that existed in its entirety in the first human is now drawn out to form a great continuous chain. All right? Now, I want to ask you a few questions about that. Okay? Okay, can we stop the sharing for a second? Great. Super. All right, so I can see the chat now. Yeah. First of all, Josh asked a question. Ha-Adam doesn't mean the Adam as if it were a thing. Um, not necessarily. Uh, Ha-Adam is simply saying Adam as, you know, th the human being. Okay? All right. But the, the idea of Adam, the name Adam, means Adame le Elion. I want, I will be like God. It's, it, the name Adam is applied to the human being, particularly when he wants to come to be uh, in, in what we call an affinity of form with, with God, 
Well, he wants to be loving and compassionate just as God is. Okay? Great. So I wanted to ask you a question, all right, which I have lost the piece for. Yes, here we are. So this soul is split up. Now I want to ask you a few questions. Was it a good thing or was it a bad thing? All right, what do you feel about that? Can you write, can you like answer on the chat? Why do you think it would be a good thing that the soul split up? And in which way do you think it might be a detrimental thing? All right, what do you actually feel about that? Anybody? Pave the way for human life, yes. Yes, well done, I thought it was meant to be on purpose like that. There's a, there's a phrase in, in the Psalms which says, that God did the whole story of the Adam and Eve and the snake on purpose. Okay, yes. Did the souls not exist before humans? That's an interesting question. The created beings... Um, <laughs> the created beings are means actually the human being specifically because the human being specifically has the capacity to recognize the divine in full consciousness. All right? So the souls definitely existed, if you like, in the higher spiritual worlds until they came into the human body all right, so yes, they did exist in that sense before the human being was created, that it, they emerge from the vessel of the Ein Sof, of the infinite. And you can certainly say that the animals are, are like lesser versions, if you like, which are meant to be here as well. Akiva says, I would be bored by myself. This is the first day on Seger and I can't <laughs> All right, that's very interesting. Are we going to be bored by ourselves? Well, one of the main ways of becoming who we're meant to be is actually through interaction, okay? Love your neighbor as yourself is be, as being, you know, a main way that we come back and we communicate is actually very important precept in the Torah, okay? So the fact you're bored by yourself is yes, because if you can't do that mitzvah of love your neighbor as yourself, it's, um, it, it, you're not, it's, it's difficult to, to do that functioning, all right? So I like what Kiva said. The purpose, yeah, Lauren and Kelsey, the purpose was to be able to bring Hashem's light down into earth. Okay, very beautiful. The issue is, is that every single person actually represents or is a unique part of Adam's soul, all right? So, if Adam and Eve had been able to eat the apple, convert the apple into the vessel it was meant to be, only for the sake of giving goodness to the creator, it would definitely be all have been done in one go. But the fact that it split doesn't mean to say we don't need to convert that apple, which is the will to receive, which I'll talk about in a minute, okay? We still need to do the work, but because we've split into all the different pieces, we have every unique person has that ability to contribute. Every single person is, is, is valuable because he has a unique ability to do the work. So we're all participating now, if you like, in fixing that apple, which got a little bit indigestible, all right? And seeing what that means and how we're gonna fix that. And the end goal is to all reunite back into the main soul. Yes, if that it is. Yeah, we all have different work. Yeah, everybody has a unique role to play. Okay, because what happens in fact is that all being unique aspects of that one soul of Adam is we 
reincarnate again and again and again until each individual soul reincarnates again and again and again until we've actually fixed that piece of the main soul, that one soul that is our particular individual uh, uh, purpose to fix. All right? So far, so good? Great. Lovely. Lovely, lovely. All right. Can you all hear me or have I forgotten to get near the mic? I hope it's all all right. I'm you're good. You're good. That. It's good. Okay. How do you like <laughs> all right. Now then, can we do the next sharing bit? Super. Right. Now then, and we go up in hose note now down. Yes. Right. That last bit in the in the black, and we go up in holiness and not down means that actually it was meant to be this way, and it's better this way. All right, because although God's Work is living and enjoying, and we go up and not down. Uh, Efrat says she's still puzzled about the purpose of breaking the puzzle if the end goal is to put it back together. All right, can we bear that question in mind? All right, and then we'll see how we go and get back to that question. It's a good question. Ah, I missed one here. Sorry, Joshua said drops of sweat into puddles, puddles into lakes and lakes into one great ocean. Beautiful, beautiful metaphor. Lovely. Okay, great. All right, thank you. So let's get, move that chat down. Okay, now, um, may I? Lovely, lovely. Yes. Now then, why did God create the world then? Joshua says it's about the journey, not the destination. I would say it's both. And now we're coming exactly to what we need to look at. What's the purpose? All right? God, the sages have taught us, specifically the Ari, okay? But he was, you know, bringing the, the, the tradition that he also received from Elio Novi, from Elijah the prophet, from Moses. God's only purpose is create, in creating the world was in order to give pleasure to his creative beings. It's here that we need to put our eyes and focus our thoughts because it is the ultimate aim and purpose of the creation of the world. Okay? Now then, what pleasure does he want to give us? The pleasure he really wants to give us is recognition of, him, of himself because the greatest pleasure that we can have is the pleasure of being in his presence, all right? Now, when we look around, particularly at the world right now, there's so much suffering, there's so much suffering. You see the, the horrific pictures from Italy and your heart goes out, it really does. Mamash, okay? So we say, well, one second, this doesn't look too much like what's going on here, all right? So for the moment, we have to believe that. We have to say, well, quite frankly, I can't see it, all right? Nevertheless, let's hold that as a belief for a moment and then figure out afterwards why we can't see that, all right? Now, since God's only purpose in creating the world was in order to give pleasure to his creative beings, we need to consider it was therefore necessary for God to create within the souls an exceedingly large desire to receive all that he planned to give them, all right? Because if God gives me, I don't know, let's say he gives me a pink elephant or let's say a real elephant, okay? I don't want an elephant. What would I do with an elephant, okay? If, if God was to give us something, we have to want it to get pleasure from it, if whatever it happens to be, okay? So if God purposes to give pleasure to his created beings, we need a desire planted within us to receive everything he plans to give us, okay? So therefore, the very purpose of creation necessitates within the souls, 
a will to receive, a will to receive pleasure, which is of the most prodigious measure, like a huge measure, compatible with the great amount of joy with which God intends to give delight. For great pleasure and a great will to receive it go together. All right? So we have within ourselves a desire to receive pleasure. Actually, a huge desire to receive pleasure. So let's stop for a moment and have a look at that. All right? God created within us a desire to receive pleasure. He wants to give us a huge amount, a huge pleasure. All right, so like I said, right now at the moment, it's hard to see it. But let's look at what, how does that desire to receive pleasure manifest within each one of us? Anybody got any ideas? How do we see it? In modern language, yeah, anybody got idea what that would mean? Ego, yes, Lauren, well done. For my, for my, my family, yes. Okay, very nice. We get pleasure from the, the basic desires that we have uh, is what, we, what the psychologists call the ego, all right? Question is, I ask myself, do we need an ego? And the answer is yes. Well, of course we need an ego. If we didn't have an ego, we couldn't survive. Of course we need an ego. Our ego is our basic personality, our basic uh, uh, expression of who we are. So why has ego got a funny connotation? Because it can be used in different ways. It can be, yay, keeps our magnificent souls grounded in our purpose here. Ha ha, that's absolutely right. Okay, so the ego is the vessel, all right, for the soul. We have to have an ego, all right, all of us. And so when we come into the world, okay, first of all, as the babies come in, uh, when they're born as a baby, we're actually bringing in basic, um, we'll, look, we'll look at that in a moment. No, we didn't, have, it, it, we didn't have no ego, that would just be mush. Okay, Moses did have an ego from Ephrat, but he transformed it. Ephrat, we're going to look at your question in a moment. It's brilliant. Okay, so we need the ego. We see that babies come into the world and they have their own personalities right from the get-go and then they develop that personality and they grow their ego all the way, you know, and we all do that until we're about 12 or 13 and actually keeps going and growing. And first we grow it in the physical, okay? We have to survive. And then we grow it in the emotional realm. Then we grow it in the uh, uh, um, mental realm. And then we grow it in the spiritual realm because that is our basic tool. Yes, absolutely. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to, to contain the soul as Lauren so rightly said. Okay, so we need the ego. But Efrat pointed out something. The basic characteristic trait of Moses was to be anav. Anav is humility. What does that mean, to be humility? To be humble means that I am transfusing my ego in a different way. Okay, instead of using my ego to be a closed vessel just wanting to take for myself i'm actually using my ego in a way to become an open channel of light for everybody now i want everybody to try just here you know in front of the camera try just seeing for yourself what the difference feels like in receiving and giving Okay, just for a moment, put your hand on your heart, okay, everybody, and just close your eyes a moment, because Maya said family, all right, put your hand on your heart, that's right, and now close your eyes, and I want you just to give to somebody you love, okay, and just watch what your hand does, 
Just give to somebody you love, okay? Your natural movement is to take a hand and move it outwards towards the other, okay? So take your hand and just give from your heart to somebody who you love, okay? So Mayo, you have to sort of like move your hand outwards, like, like, do, it, like do it with all your love, that's right, okay? So take your hand and move outwards, okay? That's giving. And what's receiving, okay? Receiving is your hand is stretched out to start off with and you bring it into yourself, okay? So those are actually opposite actions. So our basic ego in the way that we're first given is a receiving, okay? We, it, we take from all that God wants to give us and we take it into ourselves. And that's what we do as children, all right? It's what we're meant to do. We take food, we take love, we take entertainment, we receive all that God wants to give us, okay? That's what we're meant to do. But, as soon as, but what happens when we do that is we become separated from God. So let's look at source number, I've lost my piece of paper, I'll tell you which source number it is. Next bit, anyhow. Yes, right. Okay, source four. Can you scroll it down this week, uh, a little bit? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. Okay, so what's the paradox of creation? Just as a metal instrument cuts and divides a physical object, splitting it into two, so in spirituality, it is difference of form that divides one entity into two. For example, when two people love each other, we need say of them, they cleave to each other as if they were one body. But the opposite is also true. When two people hate each other, we say that they are as far from each other as the East is from the West. Now we're not discussing their locality, whether near or far. Our intention is whether or not they embody what's called affinity of form. All right. When a, pod, a person embodies, enjoys affinity of form with his or her friend, each one likes what the other one likes and dislikes what his or her friend dislikes. They love each other and are as one with each other. If, however, there is any difference of form between them, for example, if one loves something even though the friend hates it, then according to the degree of this difference of form, they are removed from each other. Opposition of form occurs when everything that the one loves, the other one hates, and vice versa. Then they are as far away from each other as the East is from the West at, at, at two opposite poles. All right, so now we're going to look at a different idea. What causes separation and what causes coming together? Separation comes when we like different things and we want different things okay so our ego we said every before everybody's ego is unique individual yeah so we all want different things that is what's causing the separation between us but we said one of one moment we said that everybody having their own individual unique ego was a good thing well, it is, but it's got a problem, okay? It keeps us separated, all right? Not only that, it keeps us separated from God because we said that the purpose of creation was God wants to give, all right? Let's make that movement again. He wants to give goodness to all created beings. And if we're just using our ego, we are receiving, okay? So that is actually causing us to be separated from God. All right, everybody got that? Or anybody got difficulties? Or everybody okay? All right, very good. Well, you can all shout out if it's no good. <laughs> Put something on the chat. On the chat. All right, I don't mind. Um, 
Oh, Josh has got a very interesting point. Wouldn't we have to know enough about ourselves, our formed egos, our stage of receiving, before we know what we like or don't like? So affinity or separation can only truly take place after that stage. Yes, Joshua, I think you're absolutely correct. Okay. To become a mature human being takes time. So I, I don't think that I, I don't think in, in some ways for myself, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got there. I, I mean, I really think that, you know, there's places where I, I know what I like and what I don't like, and there's still places in me where I really don't know yet. And I think it's like we, we, the, the, um, the personality that we have is very complex. And there's some aspects of ourselves which are we're, where we're aware and we know. And there's other aspects of ourselves which we don't yet know. And so I think, you know, the, the human being is actually considered as a whole world. Every human being is like a whole world. So within myself, I've got this whole world of ma immature aspects, mature aspects, aspects which are... Um, which are uh, aware aspects, which are giving aspects, which are receiving. It's not like, it's not one thing. Um, yeah, Michael's got a question. Um, how do we do that, May? I don't know. Uh, Michael, can you, uh, do you want to unmute your mic or something? How does that happen? I did, there's someone, whoever raised their hand, it's written here, Michael's phone. You can, oh. you can, you can ask your question. I don't know how to do it. No, you're okay. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. We heard you. Oh, I can't hear you now. It's the mute. It's gone muted again. We can hey. hear there. Yeah. There's. Hi. <laughs> Hi can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. It's it's Susan. It's I'm using my husband's phone. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I just I'm confused. You're saying that when you give you you're you're taking from Hashem wants to give you and you're taking so why is that making you farther from him when you're doing what he wants you to do I don't that's understand great, yeah brilliant question okay excellent question that's what's called the paradox of creation okay that's absolutely I mean you've, you've hit the paradox you really have um <laughs> can we go back to the to the uh source a moment uh in order sure. to question Meg. there you go right uh, which source scroll it down a bit scroll it down okay so the question go down a bit oh wait a minute different okay this is source four. Yeah, can you just scroll it down a, a, a wee bit? I think that is... Okay, all right. So I, I actually wrote the same thing more or less down twice, I think. Um, go down a bit more. Right, here we go. Right, that's it. Okay, so it's this very well to receive that we have in our nature planted there in order to fulfill God's purpose of giving us pleasure, which at the same time separates us from God. What a paradox. And that's really the essence of Susan's question, mm -hmm. right? Which is totally exactly what you're saying. Shouldn't we be receiving? But that's what God wants us to do. But the fact is, is if we do receive, we're separated from it. So how are we going to resolve this, this issue? All right. Now, we're going to resolve it, and why do we need to resolve it? Okay? Now, as from God's perspective, we are in the Ainsoff, we're in the infinite, we can be in the infinite, and we can give to, to the one soul, and that's perfectly, that's perfectly all right. But it actually, I didn't put this up as a source, I didn't think about, I didn't um, consider it, but in actual fact, uh, the the in the Ein Sof Baruchu, in the infinite we have the light of God the desire to give all go, uh, goodness to to the created being and we have the vessel 
which is called the Malchut there. All right, so we have the, the, the oily on the highest light, and we have the Malchut. And at some point, which we do not understand, the Ari teaches us it arose in, in the will of the vessel that it wanted to be, even though it was receiving from God, it wanted to be in more affinity of form. Okay? So this issue of what is affinity of form. Affinity of form means that I will be giving just as God is giving. So this was a decision that actually happened in the very highest level, which is called the Ein Sof, which is called the infinite, in where the vessel that was created the, from which we come from actually made that decision that even though in the Ein Sof it was perfectly okay for it, for it to receive from God, in the inner meaning of I, um, Hu Ushmo Echad, that he and his name are one, Nevertheless, it felt it wanted to be more in affinity of form, and that would be by giving. So this was an actual decision made, from, made by the Malchut, which is the vessel which ultimately becomes the souls, okay, which decided, even though in the end of it was okay for us to receive, now it wants to become a, a giver. And actually by doing this, it brings into creation a new form of, of receiving. Instead of just receiving for itself alone, it becomes receiving only for the sake of giving. Now, receiving only for the sake of giving is a, a, a very interesting idea. When you receive something only in order to give pleasure to the one who's giving to you. All right, can you think of an example of that in your own lives? What would receiving for the sake of giving mean? I'm going to write that down here on the chat. Well, that means I have to let go of the microphone for a second. Receiving. Okay. Anybody have an idea? Anybody for the um, anybody got an idea of what receiving the sake of giving would, would look like? Yes, well done, Efrat. Absolutely. Accepting a gift you don't like to make the other person feel good. Yes, absolutely. We do it all the time. When our children come home from kindergarten, yes, receiving a sweater you would not normally wear, but it makes your grandparent happy. Taking a compliment graciously. Yes, lovely. Um, uh, oh, by, I, sorry, I, I did receiving the sake of giving privately by accident. I didn't know how that it doesn't go to everybody. We do that again. And to everyone, there you go. Okay, yes, lovely. All right, absolutely. Like when my children used to come home from kindergarten, you know, they would um, present me with, you know, some scribble or the other, you know, and a blue blodge or something. And I'd stick it up on my fridge, you know. Did I want a blue blob? Well, for my own self, I didn't need a blue blob. But, you know, they felt it was something they wanted to give me. So there we go. So we can now see how we can use our ego, use our will to receive, but not for myself alone. What would happen if we were to use our will to receive for the sake of everybody else? Now, I have to say I'm very proud of the human beings at this point in time. Yeah, charitable donations, lovely. Yeah, Maya, lovely. What's happening is that many people in the world are pooling information, stuff that's one time they would say, they were they were they wanted to patent they want to make money out of yeah they're they're pooling the information they're sending out the data doesn't matter take anything you can use to help people through this uh crisis through the coronavirus okay this is what we need to do this is how we need to move yeah and lauren said then when we move that we'll be closer to redemption 
I'm quite sure, I mean, nothing happens by chance. This coronavirus has come in order to help us discover that we can only survive through giving, all right? But using our ego, using our unique individual, terrific personalities, terrific vessels that we have, but not to shut off, not to be only for myself alone, which will separate us, separate us from God and separate us from each other. But through, but through giving, we're using our vessels for the sake of giving. Now, how do we learn to do this? It's not straightforward, okay? Learning to do this is not easy because of our basic nature, which is to will to receive. <laughs> we ought to be alone together. Yes, yeah, all right. We've got to find the way, like Maya said right at the very beginning. We've got to find the way to connect, all right? So, okay, even in our situation, we've got to find the way to give, all right? <laughs> okay, so oh, oh, oh. Get, go, going from receivers as we are as children to receiving only for the sake of giving is actually a long process. It's a difficult process because it means taking our basic nature and changing it. Okay, now let's see, do I get a source on that? Um, a moment. Can we put the sources up again? I'll have a look what source number five is. I can't remember. Yes, here we go. Great, that's the one I wanted. Well done. Love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord your God. That's it. It is known that the purpose of all our work in Torah and Mitzvot, it is known that the purpose of all our work in Torah and Mitzvot is to come to Debekut with God may be blessed. According to the scripture, but surely keep all this commandment that I'm commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God in all his ways and be in Dvekut with him. But what does Dvekut with God mean? Unity. Dvekut means unity. How can we be in unity with him? How can we unite with God when the scripture says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire? Unite with his qualities. Just as he is merciful and gracious, so you be merciful and gracious. Okay? What does that actually mean? It means we have to start wherever we are, whichever circle we are, whoever we are. We, we need to just try that whenever we have a decision to do, to have a look and say, can I do this for the sake of giving to somebody else? Or am I just going to receive for myself alone? And it really does mean a moment to moment, bit by bit work, thing to do. Now, the Torah and Mitzvot is a tremendous guide, all right? Now, not everybody is religious, so do they say, is it just for religious? Oh dear, somebody wants me. I'm sure to climb. Okay, right. So, um, what, so, I'm sorry, I should have switched that off before, but I forgot. The Torah and Mitzvot actually helps us. If you actually look into Torah and Mitzvot, okay, you actually find that actually great, most of the Mitzvot that we're commanded to do are actually between man and our fellow man. I once went into, um, you know, the Rambam, Maimonides made a whole list of 613 commandments, you know, and, and if you actually go into them and actually look down the list, you'd be amazed, but most of them are to do with how we relate to each other. So I would say to everybody, those are the ones to concentrate on. And Rabbi Ashlag says the same. He says, concentrate on the ones between man and our fellow man. And I tell you why, when we do the religious ones, which we should also, which we can also do, and we should also do, they bring us closer to God, but they can also get into a habit. But between man and man, they're not habitual. They are things that we you know, just come up on the spur of the moment often, and we have to figure out what to do. 
But all the Torah and Mitzvot, whatever we manage to do, all right, helps us deal with our original nature of receiving and helps us focus it onto giving. There are two main channels for that. One is the mind and one is the heart. Oh dear. Right. Um, what the 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 the, uh, the one is the mind and one is the heart. The mind wants to know things. We all want certainty. Okay, that's a will to receive knowledge. We all want knowledge. We all want certainty. That's a will to receive. How do we convert that into giving? By using faith. By using trust. By using what's called bitachon, trust in God, faith in God, faith that somehow or other this is good, even though it looks very difficult, okay? Faith in the wisdom of our sages. By using our faith, we're actually counteracting our main will to receive, which is the um, uh, desire for knowledge. And then ultimately we'll be able to combine both and our desire for knowledge will be there, but using it only ethically. When a human being has a desire for knowledge, but is separated from ethics, that's when we get dreadful uh, technologies which are being used on the planet, like nuclear power, and we get destruction of the environment because with the crazy search for knowledge, divorced from ethics. But if we have that faith, and the ethics married with the desire for knowledge, then that won't happen any longer. So that's the, 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 what's called the, the rectification of the mind, the tikkun of the mind. What's the tikkun of the faith? Yes. Oh, well, how is faith giving? If I asked, asked a very good question, well, you have to give. It, it, it really is actually giving because it's certainly not receiving. Uh, when you when you put your faith in something it's like a leap into the unknown you have to like give of yourself um it really is it's it, 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 the, the will to receive is the desire for knowledge faith as giving faith really is a giving it's a, you 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 give your oh, what can i tell you it's like you 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 try to live your life you give um into into uh Yes, your trust. Yes, absolutely. You give your trust. Well done. That's it. You give your trust. Yes, Joshua got it. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay, now the other aspect is the heart. All right, what's the heart? The heart wants to receive sensual, sensual things. It wants to feel good. It want, we, I mean, that's, that's what's called the heart, is the desire to receive sensuality. We want to feel comfortable. We want to feel, we want to feel uh, good with ourselves. We want emotional comfort. It's, it's the desire for comfort, okay? And so when we actually give physically, like Maya said earlier to our family, or somebody else said charitable donations, okay? When we're giving of ourselves like that, we're actually correcting our desire for just putting our feet up and, and just, you know, sunbathing, all right? We're correcting our desire for physical comfort all right and we're putting out there the energy to give and it, it is energy okay when you when you're going against well, let's say somebody you, and we learn it with children you, yeah yeah that's right when you when you we learn it with children we learn it in our families when you know somebody's annoyed you in your uh, you know husband and wife or your partner or somebody's annoyed you Okay, you give your trust, all right? You, 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 instead of like allowing yourself to get all annoyed and emotionally upset, you put your trust there. Uh, when your child needs something, or your husband, your partner, whoever it is, when your, your friend, your neighbor, when you trust, when they need something, you get up off, uh, you know, uh, you get up off your butt and you go and, you go and help them. You go and do it and that takes energy, okay? So we, tr we transform our will to receive through the ways that we give, okay?
brilliant. Now, last source, okay? That's the one. Now I found this one just at the like five minutes before the before the <laughs> before the class, but it was, seemed to me to be so perfect about you know what's happening with coronavirus. I thought we have to have this one, all right. And this is from a piece of writing by Rabbi Ashlag, all right. And I'll tell you five you know at the end who Rabbi Ashlag was and everything. This is what he wrote. We've said that nature obliges the human species to live a societal life. That is clear. So we have to consider the laws of nature that we are obliged to keep, looking at how they apply to the life of the community. In general, we find that we need to interact with the society in which we live from the perspective of only two laws. We may define these two laws as receiving and giving benefit. That is, every member of a society must receive his needs from society, and he's also obliged to contribute to society through his work. If he does not obey these two fundamental rules, he definitely will suffer the consequences. Regarding the law that nature obliges us to receive from society, we do not need to consider this aspect to any great extent, because it's clear that failure to do so causes immediate harmful consequences, right? If we don't receive our food, we don't receive our water, or whatever, obviously. Therefore, no one neglects this. However, regarding the second rule, which is that of giving benefit to the society, the consequence of its neglect comes about in an indirect manner and is not immediately perceived. Thus, this rule is not kept properly and humankind continues to simmer in the dreadful skillet of war, hunger, coronavirus, etc., and their consequences from which we suffer even now. And the most amazing thing is that nature acts like a seasoned judge, punishing us precisely according to our development. For we bear witness to the direct relationship that exists between humanity's development and the measure of affliction and suffering we undergo in order to attain our sustenance and ensure our existence. This is absolutely correct because before, for example, before air travel, the coronavirus would have affected a few people in the area, or, or, or travel in general, would have affected a few people in the area of, of, of Wuben where it started, but it would not have traveled all over the world. The whole world is now suffering from a plague because of our development, okay? So the more we are developed, the more we actually have to put into practice the, our giving and not just our receiving, okay? If we don't uh, uh, um, uh, have that relationship that, that we can't just be receivers, we can't just uh, you know, increase our technology so that we can receive and our consumption that we can receive, without increasing our ability to give and our awareness of our giving. Because otherwise, this is precisely what will happen, that with the, with the human, humanity's development, the measure of affliction increases, all right? Likewise, because we're all developed, then we, we depend on global uh, uh, systems of, of, of uh, food supply. If we weren't so developed, everybody would have a little plot in their garden and we wouldn't be so dependent on global systems, okay? Because we've developed, we have to learn how to give and not just how to receive. We have here in front of us, I'm going back to the, the, to the, to the uh, uh, source, we have in front of us the basis for scientific evaluation. Divine providence has commanded us to fulfill the requirement of giving benefit to our fellow with all our might, such that none of us may lessen our work in bringing about the success and happiness of society. So long as we are lazy, not fulfilling our role to the required extent, nature will not cease to inflict the consequences on us and wreak its vengeance on us. And we do need to consider not only the blows we receive in our own time, but also those that hang as a drawn sword held over us in the future. Okay, the conclusion we're forced to come to is that nature will defeat us until ultimately 
we are compelled to unite to fulfill the mitzvah of the Creator in the measure that is asked of us. Right. Now, Joshua commented, let me find the chat again. Uh, that's a big we and a big us. Yes. So think globally, act locally. Right? It's a great slogan. All right. All right. One of the most amazing things that we discover is that because we are in our essence one soul, we have an enormous effect on each other. All right. Rabbi Ashlag writes, and I didn't bring that source, and we're pretty well getting out of time now. But one of the things that Rabbi Ashlag teaches us that because we are the one soul, when we do a good deed, all humanity goes up with us. When we do a negative deed, all humanity goes down. We all affect each other. All right? So each one of us, in our way, has that responsibility, not only to ourselves and to our local communities where we live, our families and the wider circle, but we can also know that we're all part of the one eternal soul. Because we are all one soul, we all affect each other. So just think of that in the positive, all right? Just in the positive. If we do one good deed in our own immediate circle, with our own friends, with our own family, we're elevating all of humanity, everybody. So never feel that we're victims. Never feel that my actions don't make a difference. Never feel that we are, we are uh, you know, only one out of a billion, so billions and billions, so what difference does it make? No, absolutely not. We all have enormous power to help the world go up simply by what we do in our own circles of, uh, 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 that we are in, okay? So we don't have to freak out and think we have to become world famous of any, or any sort, of any sort. Just have to do what we can do in our own circle, because by doing that, we are elevating the whole of humanity together because we all really are all one soul. Okay? Yes, yeah, yes, yes, right. Drops of water making ripples in the pond. Lovely, Mayor. Go, goes back to each of us being the entire world. <laughs> Bob Marley was right all along. He sure was. Echad. Lovely. Yes, that's it. Okay. Very lovely. So we've all got the idea now of, of how we can all help, right? Every single person in wherever we are, in whatever circle we are in, by working on uh, taking that will to receive and saying, my ego, I've got my own personality, my own ability to receive, and I'm going to use that in a positive way to give to everybody or to, just to give to, you know, even to one person. But because I'm giving, um, because I'm giving, then that's helping elevate um, the whole of humanity. Right, Efrat, right. Back to my original question. Why break the puzzle to put it back together again? Ah, because the puzzle now is more beautiful. Instead of in the Ingsof, all right, where you had the light giving and the vessel receiving, the, the, the light is giving the vessel kind of passive, all right? It's not doing anything. It's just receiving. But because now we're doing work, we're correcting that vessel, we're making something more beautiful than it was originally. And the Ari actually calls it a, a kishut. A kishut is a decoration, all right? In other words, the way that in the Ainsof, in the infinite, with the light giving and the vessel receiving, that was um, a, a beautiful already. But by, uh, uh, by working to receive for the sake of giving, doing this work, which is work, okay, we actually get a more beautiful uh, vessel which is the vessel which is no longer just receiving, but it's become an infinite channel 
for the light of God, where everybody is actually got that unique individual ego and yet combined into the one. So that was a brilliant question. Okay, so Joshua, if this entire story isn't about us, but about Hashem, the breaking of the puzzles about Hashem's journey. All right, so let, yeah, time to finish up. Okay, so just answer that one question. All right. We call Hashem the Ein, one of the names of, the, of, of Hashem is the Ein Sof, the infinite. And that includes both the light and the vessel together. So what we know of Hashem, what we call Hashem includes the souls. Okay? And the souls as a, as a, as a together is called the Shekhinah. So the story is both about us, but not as separated from Hashem, but as part of Hashem. Okay? Great. Wonderful. All right, my dear ones. Okay? Bless you, bless you.